Hello, and welcome back to ECMATH. Today, we're going to be talking about linear input transformations of functions. That is, things that happen to the x before the function happens. So, this is of the form f of stuff, where all the things are happening to, thing, to the function before uh, the function occurs. That is in contrast to what we did in the last video, where we talked about stuff that happened out here or out there. This is going to be all about the inputs of a function. Um, there are three particular linear inputs we're talking about today. Uh, reflection over the y-axis, which is accomplished by, in general, f of minus x. Expand or contract um, is the kind of the fancy word, or stretch or shrink, horizontally. That's uh, accomplished by having f of, we'll just say, kx, where k is a number and shift left or right, that's established by doing f of x plus or minus uh, k, again, where k is a number. So those are the three types of transformations that we're going to have. And of course, the hardest thing that we're going to do is do multiple combinations of uh, one, two, or even three of these different transformations all in one. Um, and again, just like before, the key idea of all these transformations, it's not going to change the shape of the parent. Uh, whatever the parent looked like, whether it was a u or a v, or a crazy W, uh, none of these transformations will change the relationship between the points. They might stretch it, they might reflect it, they might move it around, but nothing's gonna really, really change. Um, just like before, here are the parents that we might possibly use today. Um, X squared, square root, uh, cubic, cube root. Uh, we might also talk about absolute value of X, that shows up a couple times. Um, we might come in and talk about signs, so uh, if you're not familiar with these parent functions, Go ahead, look them up, just make sure you're really uh, okay with those parent graphs first um, before we jump into this video. All right, here's our first graph of the day. Uh, it's going to be x plus 4 quantity squared. Our parent function here is going to be x squared. And I'm going to do a couple things with the parent just to, to work it up. And because this is the first graph, I'm going to take a little more time uh, really thinking about the parent just today. Uh, parent looks like this. And it has some specific points that I want to talk about. Um, with any parent graph, you want to think about at least three specific points. I'm going to think about the point uh, negative one, which squares becomes one, zero squares becomes zero, and one squares becomes one. So those are just the easiest points to think about. Um, and in particular, I'm really going to think about this point where zero becomes zero, because that is where the graph changes direction. Notice that um, here the graph is decreasing, uh, then over here the graph starts to increase, and so we have a change of direction of the graph. And that's gonna happen right at the zero, but specifically it's gonna happen where the input 2x squared was zero. So that's gonna inform how I deal with this guy over here. Um, the very first thing that I might do when I approach this function is say, well, what would make x plus 4 equal 0? What x would make that? And then I'm going to solve that, so I'll take away 4, take away 4, and I'll get x equals negative 4. Okay, pretty easy equation to solve. Here's what that means. At the point negative 4, this little guy is going to be the vertex. Think about going uh, through that sort of in the forward direction. I solved in what I would call the backwards direction there when I was solving that equation. Now I'm going to go in the forwards direction. Uh, I'm going to do negative 4 plus 4 squared is 0 squared, which is 0. That's the vertex of the parabola, just like I had over on the parent. Uh, and once I've identified the vertex, then I am able to construct the rest of the graph just by plotting points. Uh, so this goes over one, up one, then it's gonna go over two, up four, all the way up into my graph, over uh, two, up four in that way. And you can draw a nice smooth curve. So that was pretty convenient. Uh, I know you've seen parabolas before and you're probably used to them working in that way. Um, but you might not be used to this idea of setting the inside equal to zero to find the vertex. And that's actually gonna be really useful because it's applicable in basically all transformations, not just parabolas. 
Uh, before we go, we should describe what this translation was. This was a horizontal translation or shift uh, by four units to the left. All right, and then we're going to move on to the next graph. Um, so our next graph is one square root of one-third x. Um, so this one-third is going to act in a pretty weird way. Uh, you maybe read from the book that this is going to be a uh, horizontal shrink. Uh, that's incorrect. You probably didn't read that in the book. This is going to be a horizontal stretch by a factor of three. And at this point, you might be saying, no way. How can that make a stretch, right? We got one third. One third is smaller than one. Obviously, something that's smaller than one has got to shrink the graph, uh, like I almost said before. But it's not. It is, in fact, going to be a stretch. And here's why. Um, first, to explain why this is going to result in a stretch, I want to make sure we are really thorough on the parent. So uh, we're going to make an in-out table for square root x. I'm going to write in kind of a weird way. I'm going to make an in, and then I'm going to say square root of in. Right, and that's really what, how we would phrase out. Uh, or we might just write x and root x. Um, now, in regular square root x, if I input zero, I take the square root of zero, I output zero. If I input one, I take the square root of one, I output one. If I input four, that's the next nice number, right? If I input anything between one and four, I'll get a not nice number as a root. So but if I input four, I will get two. If I input nine, I'll get three. Now, that's the parent, and I'm going to go ahead and plot uh, some of the points off that parent right now. Now, here's what I'm going to do with this table. Let me zoom in on this a little bit. I'm going to erase where it said in. I want to take, actually, both spaces, and I'm going to take the entire phrase one third x and replace that where it said in do that looks like. so this is creating it's sort of forcing the parent table to become the table of the child function that we want and then what i need to do is actually expand my table to the left and we're doing an input transformation so i always expand my tables to the left when I'm doing input transformations. And I need to figure out what x will give me those values when I multiply it by one third. Hmm. Okay, well, one of those is easy. Uh, zero times one third is zero. Then the square root of zero is still zero. So I, it looks like I'm gonna still go through the point zero, zero. That's quite nice. Uh, then I think, well, what would go here? So that when I times it by one third, it's going to equal one. And we could think about it. We could try some numbers. In this case, it's pretty easy to see that that number should be three. And it might be pretty easy to see that I need to figure out what goes here times it by one third it needs to equal four. Oh, that's a little bit harder. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna maybe go and write a separate equation. I'm gonna say x times one third equals four. And how would I solve that? I guess I would multiply both sides by three. I would get x equals 12. So you can always kind of go and write a separate equation over on the side and try to solve it. This is going to be 12. There's also a key realization that I just made as I was solving this equation. I ended up multiplying by 3. The opposite operation of multiplying by 1 third. And so if you're used to moving forwards in the table, uh, moving from left to right by multiplying, you can also jump backwards in the table by doing the opposite operation, either divide by one third or times three, however you'd, you'd rather phrase it. Those are gonna be the same, 
They're the opposite operation of the thing we were doing to move forwards. So uh, I'm going to use that for nine. Um, instead of setting up a separate equation over on the side, that excuse me feels like a lot of extra work. I'm just going to take nine, multiply it by three, and get 27. Now, I'm not going to plot all these points. Um, I will plot a few. So I'm going to plot... Uh, what color should I plot it? Let's do red. I'll plot 0, 0. I will plot 3, 1. We'll plot 12, 4. This was 9, 10, 11, 12. Or 12, 2. And then I'm going to give up and connect them. And what I'd like you to observe is that this is a, indeed, horizontal stretch by a factor of... Uh, here's how you can see that in the graph. Every, compared to the parent, every x value has tripled. Wait, that point's wrong. That's right. Every x value has tripled. 4 times 3 is 12. 1 times 3 is 3. 0 times 0. Well, that's just 0, but that, did, that stayed the same. And the way you can see that reflected is looking at the lengths measured along here. There's a unit of 1. That's a unit of 3. Uh, measured out here. That's 4 away. Well... That's now 12 away. And so when I was plotting that stretch, uh, I kind of counted just the, along those blue lines. I counted out four and I multiplied that all the way by three, uh, took those in three chunks all the way over to 12. If I wanted to find that 27, uh, that last point, what I could do is take about this length and just mark it out about three, one, two, three times. This is if I was doing a rough sketch. And I know the graph would kind of cross there We'll say ish. Uh, it's pretty close. Not exact, but close. Um, so going back to the last graph, and then we're going to talk about the one third x again. Uh, we've had this weird thing happen where it feels like input transformations operate backwards, right? For example, moving to the left in the negative direction on the axis uh, corresponds with a positive shift inside. Well, the reason that's happening and it's going to show up again with the one third, is that what we're really doing is solving an, the equation inside for x when we graph this. And when we solve the equation inside for x, what was our first step? We subtracted 4 from both sides. That subtraction of 4 to solve for an x is what moves that function over 4 units. In this equation, when I solve this, what did I do? I multiplied by 3. So the process of solving for the x inside, sort of like reverse operations, reverse order of operations, that's what creates this as a stretch instead of being a shrink. Another way to think about it, uh, especially with this one third I find very helpful, is that you uh, need, because uh, one third x uh, shrinks uh, the value in the parentheses, we'll say, or underneath the square root, I guess, in that case, uh, you need uh, more x to make the same amount. And if we need more x to make the same amount, that means our graph is going to have to go farther out on the axis in order to generate the same y values. All right, coming on to graph number three. This is going to be our last graph with a single transformation, and it's a fun one. Uh, it's a negative x uh, inside the parentheses. And I do know, we're going to pretend that we don't know for a second. We're going to talk about it later. I do know that negative x parentheses to the third is equivalent to negative x to the third, because this is like a negative one, um, or really it's like negative x, negative x, negative x, which is just negative one, x to the third. However, 
I'm going to choose to think about it in this way first, and then at the end we'll talk about what that means over there on the side. So we're just going to put that over there for now. We've maybe read that this is going to be, or I said at the start, this is going to be a uh, y-axis reflection. Here's why. Let's do the same game with the our, our, our in out table. So I have in out. Uh, so this is going to be like the in cubed. So easy numbers here are negative one goes to negative one, zero, zero, one, one, and we'll do two, eight. Well, if our in is really replaced with negative x, that means the original x must have been the opposite, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2, uh, to be switched around. Or another way to say it is on the axis, uh, let me go ahead and draw an axis, uh, to say it is taking on the axis, taking x and replacing it with minus x. And so as we switch from x to minus x, or switch x and minus x, uh, that feels like whatever the values are, that's going to be a reflection over the y-axis. All right, so let's go ahead and graph this thing. First, I'm going to graph the parent. Then what I'm going to do is think about these values. So I had the value uh, 1, 1. When I do negative x, that's going to be reflected over to here and become negative 1, 1. Again, notice I'm only changing x values. Y values are staying exactly the same. Uh, same over here. This little guy was negative 1, negative 1. That's going to reflect on over and become uh, 1, comma, negative 1. X values change. Y values stay the same. 0, of course, reflects to be 0. And let's sketch the child. Uh, so that was a pretty easy one. Um, these y-axis reflections on their own are not really that bad. The way the place they get challenging is later on when they're combined with other transformations. Uh, so that was just a nice little y-axis reflection on a cubic. Um, I said before I would talk about the this property over here, um, where the, the function multiplied out, and it is actually true that negative x cubed is equal to negative x cubed. Uh, so we would describe this transformation as a reflection over the y axis, um, because all the y values from the original were exchanged with, or all the x values were exchanged with their original x values. Um, but by algebra, we can transform it into this. This we would describe as a reflection uh, over the x axis, because this is taking output values, y values, and making them negative. So as a reflection, if I graph this one, Parent, what that would do is take this point and move it down here. And it would take this point and move it up there. But the cool thing is, when you connect those two points, you get the same result. And that feels like a cool kind of symmetry. In fact, we've talked about this kind of symmetry before. This is odd symmetry. We have f of negative x equals negative f of x. That was the test for odd symmetry. So in this particular case, uh, that leads to something cool. Now, uh, I want you to be careful because a teacher might ask you, what type of transformation is this? And if they ask you that, uh, you should definitely think about whether the inputs or outputs are being transformed. You might say that these are equivalent or have an equivalent result but they are not really the same transformation, right? There, there's different operations occurring. Um, and it's just because the situation was pretty simple, right? Regular x cubed uh, with only a negative in front that made that happen. But I don't know, it's kind of cool. I like x cubed, it's a neat function.
Now we're going to do a little sequence of graphs. Um, first, I'm going to graph absolute value of 4x. Um, this is a horizontal uh, compression. Uh, and then we're going to do this, keep this horizontal compression and do it with a couple other types of shifts to kind of bring us in, uh, bring us into those double uh, transformation territory. Horizontal compression. Whoa, why is this a compression? I thought it was four. Four is a big number. This should be an expansion. But of course, everything in the inputs kind of works in the opposite way you'd expect. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and make that in-out table again, uh, just a couple values and try to illustrate what I mean. Uh, so here I'm going to have absolute value, 4x. I'm just going to go straight to this step. Uh, 4x and then I'm going to say x. Now, I don't know anything about what x needs to be, um, but I do know that if I have 0 and I take the absolute value of 0, I'll get 0. Absolute value of 1, I'll get 1. This value of negative 1, I'll get 1. Um, negative 2, I'll get positive 2, etc. And then I think, well, shoot, what could get me back to this column? Well, if I go forwards from this column, say I plugged in a number uh, 5, then I would do 5 times 4 and get 20. Uh, absolute value of that is, I guess, 20. And this is great, uh, but also I just don't really feel like plotting the point 520, and it also doesn't tell me anything about what type of transformation this is. I really want to think about the action on specific points that I know uh, know everything about so that I can figure out uh, the shape of the entire graph instead of just weirdly specific points. So this is true, but it's not going to really be helpful. Um, but I noticed that I, when I moved through that table, I did 5 times 4. So if I want to go back the other direction in the table, I bet I could divide by 4. Right, to go, so, or if, another way to think about it is if I was solving the equation 4x equals 1, what would I do? I would divide by 4. So, 0 is going to map to 0. I just solved this. 4x equals 1, so 1 fourth. 1 fourth, and to get negative 2, I would divide that by 4, and I would get... Uh, negative one half. So for a horizontal compression, I need less x to get the same y values, which is why this is going to be compressed with reference to the parent. Okay, we've played enough. You're probably tearing your hair out. Mr. X, just graph this thing. Well, all right, here we go. Here's the parent, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, ba, 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 ba. Now, 4x, this is going to be a horizontal compression. So watch how I graph this. This point had coordinates 1, 1, but now it's going to move over here and have coordinates 1 fourth. This point had coordinates 2, 2. Now it's going to move over here and have coordinates 1 half, 2. So every point's x values are shrinking in half. Or not in half, in quarters. This point was at 3. It's going to have a value of 3 quarters. So it's going to be like right around there and there. And I guess I should do one more point. The point over here at 4, which is up in my table, so I'm, I'm not going to go all the way out on the graph, but that would go over to there and become the point 1, 4. And now let's go ahead and connect the dots. Ooh, we're getting pretty close there. And that's going to be our transformed absolute value graph. Um, you might notice that this line, right, the absolute value graph is sort of two lines and slope four. Uh, so that's kind of a cool trick when you're graphing absolute value transformations is um, the number inside uh, the transformation is going to represent the slope 
of those uh, arms of the graph, uh, positive or negative. So this was a horizontal compression. I needed less x. Each x moved in. I needed less x to get the same y. Again, notice that I did have the same y values every time. Let's do a slightly harder one. Calling this graph 4.5 compared to graph 4. I have 4x minus 8. Now, you might think that this is going to be a shift rightwards by 8 units. Uh, I think most people do when they first see it, but it turns out that's not correct. Uh, it is still a shift rightward. It's not going to be by 8 units at all. So this is a first example of sort of a weird input transformation. Uh, let's figure out how many uh, shifts rightward it will be. So what I need to do or think about is the parent. If I could get really if I could get this to equal zero that would tell me where the turning point of the graph is because in the parent uh, where x equals zero in absolute value of x is where the turning point is so what I'm gonna do is set up an equation and uh, when you're doing order of operations uh, it's usually good let's see let's add eight and eight so i get four is eight divide by four mm -hmm. x equals two because we've already graphed absolute value of 4x and because of this that's enough information to graph I'm actually planning to graph this function about three different times in different methods or different manners. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and just figure out what the original graph looks like right now. So I'll go ahead and graph that transformation with the vertex in the place we expect. That's super weird, right? That it was a shift of two units. I find this setting the inside equal to zero pretty convincing though. Like nothing else is gonna make that turning point happen. Um, and you can of course check some values and test it out, right? I might check uh, uh, one and uh, three, right? If I wasn't sure. So I would say, all right, uh, four times one minus eight, that's uh, minus four, uh, absolute value of that in the equation, that's four. Ah, so this seems like one four is a point on the graph, and I might check three. Uh, three times four minus eight, that's four is four. Oh, and three four is also a point on the graph. Uh, so if you're gonna kind of do that, you might as you can go ahead and do some extra points to check. I think it kind of helps. But man, I wonder if, why isn't it that eight? Uh, so let's take a look at some other ways to approach this. Um, the way that uh, I like to approach transformations sometimes is with a sequence of transformations. That is, listing out the transformations from the equation in order that I'm going to do, and then just uh, drawing them all on the same axis. I did this a lot in the last video. Um, I haven't done this a lot yet because we've only been doing single transformations. Uh, with input transformations, there's actually two correct methods. Um, there's the books way and there's the factoring way and honestly I've thought about the books way I've tried to make sense of it um, I don't like it just straight up I think it is although valid it's a lot easier to mess up than the way that I use which is factoring the inside I think it's a lot easier but you know what I'm gonna show you guys both and then you can choose so the idea is uh, the order of transformations is whatever steps you would take in that order to solve the inside for x if it were an and if it were an equation. So we had the equation absolute value 4x minus 8. 
And say I wanted to solve 4x minus 8 equals 0. I did want to solve that. I would first do plus 8, and then I would divide by 4. So that's going to translate to a shift right by, this is going to be crazy, 8 units, and then a horizontal compression by a factor of 4. Right? So think about the order, right? I did add 8, so that means it has to correlate with a shift right. And then I divided everything by 4. Uh, that is a horizontal compression. Well, let's see. What would that look like on the graph? Here's what, here's what it would look like. Here's the parent, absolute value. I would shift it all the way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight units. And that becomes the point eight, zero. And uh, seven, one, nine, one, etc. And then what happens, this is the crazy bit. Every X value, every single one now has to shrink, divide by four. So this point where it was now the way all the way out at eight has to go back over to two zero because I had to divide the X's by four. And this seven has to go over to, I guess, uh, seven fourths comma one. This has to go over to nine fourths comma one. And that uh, creates the uh, correct result. And so that's how the eight becomes a two, right? Is it actually, if you think about it this way, it really does move out to eight, but then it gets compressed, it gets pulled back. Uh, this action of moving out and compressing, I find that so counterintuitive, I actually made a little uh, demo of it. So what I have is uh, just a graph on Desmos of kx minus eight, and I'm gonna change that coefficient as it goes. So look, as I change the coefficient, Right now it's one that just represents x minus eight, uh, so shift it over eight. So I change that coefficient in. Notice how it's kind of shrinking in. Um, I like to think about this a little bit like a spring. In fact, I'm gonna add something to the graph that makes it look even more like a spring. We'll add a little restriction on x so that you can only see the positives. And imagine that right there at uh, seven, that's just being held solid and the graph is shrinking and expanding off of that point. So this is an illustration of that. Now you might be saying, wow, that's that's like bonkers, that's bananas. Well, guess what? You've actually seen this before. Where have you seen it before? Sine curves. The coefficient on a number inside of a sine curve. Now we haven't actually talked about what, the, what an eight might do inside of a sine curve, but the coefficient on a number that represents the, you, you might think about it as representing the angular speed, right? And uh, a higher number inside represents a faster turning Ferris wheel to think about a high dive uh, unit. And that means there's going to be more graphs or the graphs are going to be, or the waves are going to be more compressed. So that idea of a big number is actually a compression. You know, you've seen it before. It's actually uh, something you've been working with for at least, uh, let's say a year, maybe six months. Um, and it's something that is going to last you quite a while as well as you uh, go through your math career. So there's that little little fun bonus that you added here. Uh, so the book way likes to shift and compress. I'm okay with that. Honestly, I find that confusing, right? Like this moving over, no thank you. So here's what I like to do. Uh, I'm going to call this the factoring way. The first move you can always do, so we hit absolute value, is this. Keep the absolute value, make it a little bit bigger, and then factor that 4 right on out. And what happens when you factor that 4 out? It becomes an x minus 2. Now I want to think about what would happen if I had to solve uh, 0 equals 4 parentheses x minus 2. I would change, I've now changed the order of operations, haven't I? Now I would first divide by 4, 
and then I would get 0 equals x minus 2, I would add 2. And so my sequence of transformations is going to be uh, compress and then shift because it's the order that I would do those same operations in if I was solving this equation in factored form. Now here's what that looks like. I'm a lot fonder of this method. Oh. Here's the parent. Uh, the child is compressed to have a slope of four. So that's why I had you guys graph this one above. That's absolute value four X. And then I just take this guy and move it over two units. Oh, shameful. Uh, and so that seems like a much better way to approach this. Uh, first do the compression, because oh man, it's a lot easier to compress around zero than it is to compress uh, once the graph has, if the graph has already been shifted. So do all your compression. You can also at this point do all your reflections. Now this one didn't have any, but if you had reflections, a lot easier to reflect around zero. Then do your shift right at the end. All right, we're gonna start speeding things up a little bit uh, as we get into these double input transformations, just so we can get through some more examples. I think we've talked about all the theory we need to talk about. It's just time to do some math. Uh, so I've got the square root of negative x plus 3. First, I'm going to be thinking about the parent function. Square root, I think we graphed that before. It looks like that. Uh, so I'm going to be trying to transform this. I remember that negative x is a reflection uh, over y, and the plus 3 is a shift. Uh, now, because there's a negative x, that's going to affect the shift. There's going to be a shift. It's going to uh, be in a weird direction. We've maybe done an example in class or you've seen something like that on your homework. Um, let's see what goes on with the shift. And I'm going to do this same graph twice, first using the sequence from the book, then using the factored sequence. So the sequence from the book or the order of transformation says shift and then reflect. My order is going to be to factor the inside until it's negative parentheses x minus 3, and I will reflect and then shift. We should get the same result on both of these. Both of these are correct, uh, and I will show you a third way that is incorrect if we have time at the end. So here we go, sequence 1. So first I'm going to shift plus 3, here's our parent, I'm going to shift that 3 units over this one, and then kind of a weird thing happens, in fact I'm going to take this all the way out, make this graph kind of big. When we reflect it, we said we're reflecting over the y-axis. And we have to remember that we are really, truly, if we're doing it this way, reflecting over the y-axis, which means this point, negative 3, 0, has got to go all this long way, all the way over to positive 3, 0. This point at 1, uh, comma 2 has got to go all this long way over to negative 1, 2. And the only point that doesn't get to change, uh, or that isn't required to change, is that y-intercept that I, I was sure to graph. And so, weird marker. So there's sort of a transformed child of square root negative x plus 3. This is a pretty good explanation. I actually like this for one reason, which is shows why plus 3 shifts that way when you have a negative x. Uh, it's because it really does first, if you think about the shift first, it does shift to the left. But then the whole darn thing is reflected and so it appears like it was a shift to the right. 
that's nice, but I, I find this, again, really challenging to graph because carrying out that second reflection, that was hard. It was just a hard thing to do. Well, take a look at what happens if we factor it. No good. Here's my parent. And if the first thing I do is reflect it, then all I have to do is take these values and reflect them over. And that's a whole lot easier, at least to me, a whole lot easier to reflect around zero, to reflect the parent that I'm used to, um, than it is trying to shift it and then reflect some other weird graph. And then I can take this and just shift it three, it's that one. And when I do this, even the shift operates in the direction I'd expect, right? X minus three ends up being a shift in the positive direction. So now I have the familiar points. I can go over one, up one. And from here, I'm just gonna go count back four, up two. Uh, so that's where knowing the shape of your parent helps. Cool. And I'm gonna try to draw a semi-decent looking parent graph on here. Uh, so I've just showed you two correct ways to do it with two different sequences of transformations, uh, which I think is kind of cool, right? The book gives you one way, we've given you another. Uh, you can pick which one you like, but I do want you to be careful. Uh, because now that you have two different sequences, we're giving you some choice, it is also possible to do things in the wrong order. So here's what I mean by that. Uh, say someone said, all right, I uh, like how the book does it. I'm going to shift the graph over first. So here's my parent and it shifts over to three like this. And then I'm going to reflect it. But instead of thinking really carefully that about reflecting over Y, they think a little lazily and they say, well, I know when I do a reflection over uh, at zero, right? It just does this. And they say, well, let me reflect over the axis there. Uh, that's the error that often is made. Uh, so this is not uh, the correct sequence uh, and you want to watch out for it so you know you, you're going to get really used to if you do your reflections this way um, sometimes you might do them in the opposite order uh, and reflect sort of the wrong way uh, watch out for that it might happen to you that you are asked to do transformations or tables on something where you don't know the equation and this is kind of uh, an extra challenge. We're really used to, with an equation, being able to plug in points. But guess what? I've got a table. I've only got four points, and those are the only values we've given me. And I somehow have to make this table for f of 2x minus 8. Uh, well, here's how we'd approach that. So first, instead of f of x, uh, I'm just going to call this in and f of in. And I can replace that in with whatever I want. So what I'm really going to replace it with is f of 2x minus 8, right? The, the result, that's what they said they wanted. And then over here, 2x minus 8. And then I'm going to think about, you know, if I had to solve 2x minus 8 equaled negative 3. So I'm going to go ahead and just like solve the first line. Think about the order I would do things in. First, I would add 8 get 5, and I would have 2x equals 5, so then I would have to divide by 2. So as I work backwards in the table, I'm going to make two more columns. I'm going to label them um, 2x and then x, and then I think about as I go backwards, I'm going to take away 8, just like uh, add 8, um, because that's the operation I did when solving an equation, and then I'm going to divide by 2. So I'm using opposite operations of whatever's inside. Uh, so add 8 to 3, that's 5. Divide by 2 is 5 halves. And that says that this graph would go through the point 5 halves, 5 halves, and 2. And that would be like my total in-out table. Uh, going backwards over here, add 8, that's 8. Divide by 2, that's 4. Add 8 is 10. Divide by 2 is 5. Add 8 is... 13 divided by 2, 
is 13 over 2. Most fractions are really nice. I don't really care what decimal number that is. 13 over 2 is perfectly fine. Uh, so now we've arrived at a total in-out table. And if you wanted to kind of present your answer, you could now say, ah, a table for f of 2x minus 8 looks like this. You know, 5 halves, 2, 4, 7, 5, 0, and 13 over 2, 10. And that's the only way you can do this, because you don't know the equation for f. You don't know what the heck goes on in here, right? There's sort of like a mystery function box right here uh, that's only been defined by those four numbers in the table. You can't do anything with that. You have to come up with x values that will give you this column so that you can get values that are going to end up in that column. Uh, and that's how you approach it when you've got a table. Uh, we kind of touched on this with x cubed. It's actually possible for a transformation to be two different types. And of course, um, when they're different types, uh, they're not actually the same transformation, but you can say that they're equivalent. Here's what I mean. Uh, this we would say is a horizontal uh, shrink by a factor of four. Well, if you think about sh taking a square root, here's the parent, and shrinking it down, doesn't that also kind of make it taller? does but if it makes it taller I might say by what factor and that's where our good friend algebra comes in aren't we glad we did algebra um, it's the same as root 4 root X you can split things up which is the same as 2 root X so a in the case of square root X it's not true for every function but in the case of square root X a horizontal shrink by a factor of 4 is the same as a vertical stretch by a factor of 2, which is pretty cool. Uh, so sometimes that might mean uh, if you want to do this with a square root, factor things out. Absolutely, as long as you're careful and you're really, really sure on your algebra, it can make your life easier. Um, and it can help you find some equivalent you know, graphs and, and other shortcuts. Uh, let's try this again. Uh, one half x squared. So this is going to be a horizontal uh, stretch uh, by a factor of two. But let's just bring that in. This is really the same as one half squared x squared or one fourth x squared. Oh, whoa. That's a vertical shrink by a factor of one quarter. So you can th think about this parabola, parent, as either getting shorter, right, or getting wider. And they're going to give you the same result. That's what the algebra says. Um, now, if you were riding on this function, right, if this was like a weird carnival ride, they would definitely feel different. They're different transformations but they have the same result. Uh, of course, that's not always true, so I do want you to watch out, right? If I have sine negative one half x, you can't factor out one half and bring it out, right? So this is an example where uh, sine of one half x, one half here would make the graph longer. But if you brought the one half out, it would make the graph shorter. Which is a totally different transformation. So it's not always about factoring out. Sometimes you can't actually make that difference. Um, you notice I didn't talk about the negative. It is actually possible in this problem to bring the negative out because we've discussed before that sine is odd. Uh, and if you're like, what's going on here? Just wait until chapter four. This is actually equivalent to negative sine 1 half x, only because of the odd symmetry of the sine graph. Right, notice it has that odd rotational symmetry. Uh, so the negative can't actually come out there, but nothing else can. Uh, so you could think about the transformation. Now. All right.
We are going to end this video with just two more examples of not single, not double, but triple input transformations. So here we go. I've got a negative, I've got a one third, and I've got a plus two. I'm going to switch back to just doing these in one way, not doing the, the two sequences. And uh, since it's my video, I'm going to do my preferred way, which is factoring out a one third. Uh, in fact, factoring out a negative one third, and I get x minus six. So that now says that three things are going to happen. One, uh, reflection over y. Two, uh, horizontal stretch by a factor of three. And three, shift to the right six units. Uh, with those in mind, I'm going to uh, stop talking and just carry out that transformation. Um, if I wanted to see, this is a pretty cool graph, uh, if I wanted to kind of self-check, what I could do is find the y-intercept by plugging in x equals zero. In fact, I'm going to do that. So it would be the square root of one-third times zero plus two, which is square root of two, which is about 1.4. And so um, what I'm, I'm, the whole point of doing that is looking at the graph and saying, does that look like it's at about 1.4? Did I get it in kind of the right spot? It appears like I did. Uh, so this is how we've accomplished this transformation. Uh, the red is going to be our final transformed graph with a sequence, uh, a reflection, a stretch, and a shift. A lot of stuff going on here. Nice graph. For our final graph of the day, I have uh, another cubic. Cubics are quite fun. Uh, I've got three transformations again. I've got a negative, I've got a one-fourth, and I've got a minus one. So just like before, I'm gonna factor this. I'm gonna make use kind of brackets in here. Now, when I take uh, one fourth out of one, that number is gonna get larger because when I multiply it back together, that number would get smaller. So this is gonna be. A, um, a larger number inside and that's something that happens with this weird factoring. I think this would be really challenging to do with the shift and then stretch way. Uh, I really like the idea of stretch first and then shift. So here's the three things in order. It's going to be reflection over y. It's going to be a uh, vertical stretch by factor four. It's going to be a shift that way for units. So just like before, I am going to stop talking and graph it.
So I just checked the y-intercept again just to see because I uh, point lined up and it does actually work out that you get a zero comma minus one. So this was a pretty hard transformation to do again uh, just because it gets so wide but I wanted to show you one that gets really wide um, especially compared to the parent. Uh, it's so important with cubics especially that you always include those extra two points Otherwise, there's no way that you're going to get the direction of the, or the size of the shift really communicated correctly, and it's going to just be really hard to draw. Um, as long as you've got those three points, even if you're a really the worst drawer in the world, uh, you're still going to be able to correctly communicate those shifts. So that's our last graph for the day. Uh, one fourth, negative one fourth x minus one whole quantity cubed. Graph looks like this. Um, so I'm going to end it here. I plan to do one more video in this series where I do uh, input and output transformations just in sequence. I'm just going to not even do any theory, just a bunch of examples. Um, stay tuned for that. But for now, uh, I hope this has been helpful. I know it went a little long, um, but I really do hope it was helpful for at least some of you guys. Uh, so you've been watching ECMath. Thank you and good night.